Dear all, today we have among us Commander Madhvendra Singh, who is a chartered engineer and a member of the prestigious IEEE. He is an international arbitrator and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. He is also a member and arbitrator with London Maritime Arbitrators Association London and many other arbitrator, arbitral institutions. He completed his master's from IIT Delhi and is also a certified uh, individual in ar artificial intelligence and maritime laws and machine learning and is a faculty of blockchain and smart contracts. He is an international faculty on maritime arbitration and has written articles and chapters on the subject. He also specializes in maritime arbitration, construction, as well as defense contracts. We welcome you, sir. Hi. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Anamika. And uh, I think more or less uh, you have really covered whatever I've done uh, so far. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, if you allow, we would start with the uh, interview. Yes, sure. I would, I would rather uh, call it an introduction. I mean, I'm sure people are not interested in interviews anymore. We have so many of them. But rather, if we can learn from each other, that is the best thing. Thank you. Sure, sir. So, sir, my first question to you is that you have been an officer in the Navy as a chartered en engineer, and now you're also a maritime arbitrator. So I think our viewers would be interested in knowing how your journey has been from being an officer to a maritime arbitrator, as well as member of the FCIR, and also a faculty of maritime arbitration. OK. Uh, thank you, Anamika. Uh, I think that you're basically asking me about my journey of uh, being in the Navy and then coming to become an FCIR and an arbitrator. So more or less, since when you gave my introduction, probably you have actually covered my journey. You know? uh, but yeah, so uh, more or less uh, from the very early childhood, you know, I've been a very uh, unapologetic uh, optimist. And the uh, thing which always excited me was uh, dispute resolution. You know, it was whether between friends or between family, you know, with the siblings fighting, you would always be the one who's trying to resolve. So uh, that was something which really uh, interested me. So when I uh, was in the Navy also, there's one very uh, important uh, aspect uh, which I learned was mainly uh, to do with uh, the importance of uh, interpersonal relationships. And uh, what I learned was uh, it's not uh, that you earn your relationships uh, by just uh, being friends or uh, giving people awards and certificates, you know. Uh, you really have to be in the trenches with your troops uh, to really empathize with them, to be with them, to feel with them. So uh, that is something which is relevant and important for all of us, interpersonal relationships. So I benefited from it and uh, not just uh, uh, being uh, friends with the officers in the Navy, but also friends with the outside world. And that's when uh, I got introduced to uh, the ADR, the Alternate Dispute Resolution. So when I was in the Naval Dockyard, uh, I came across few disputes. At that time, I really didn't know what arbitration is. And uh, that was also the time when uh, the Mumbai Center for International Arbitration was coming up. So again, through friend circles, getting to know about what's happening in the world. So there is something which really attracted me very from the very first day. And then I went on to uh, do the training with CIR, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I really liked it. And, uh, you know, sometimes in life, it is very important to be able to learn to unlearn. And uh, when it came to learning arbitration, I had nothing to unlearn, actually. So because uh, I'm not a lawyer, because I don't have a particular style of advocacy. So it was easy for me to learn. I was interested in dispute resolution, so I could pick up uh, the nuances of arbitration. And it's really uh, wonderful. I mean, the whole... Uh, the procedural aspects of an arbitration, the dispute resolution is really uh, beautiful. And I'm glad that uh, our country has been able to adopt it. The most more and more uh, commercial parties are adopting it. And I think the future is also pretty very uh, bright as far as the alternate dispute resolution is concerned, especially uh, with the times that we are going through right now. I think there is something which uh, uh, people would like to do. So. Uh, See, I have been always something uh, which really excites me is uh, intellectual stimulation is very important. So I've always uh, been uh, learning new things. I've uh, studied social service at a very early age. Uh, then I even went into robotics. And then the technologies of the artificial intelligence and this now the blockchain, uh, which is really disruptive in nature. And uh, the best thing is that you don't feel the disruption. 
I think the technology which is the best in disruptive is the one which is not felt. But it is inevitable for the future, and uh, I think uh, it's only because of that. Uh, you know, the quest for learning, the quest to be uh, good with people, always have a good interpersonal relationships, is what has led to me to be an FCIR and become an international arbitrator also. Thank you for your insight, sir. Uh, if you would like, we may proceed to the next question, sir. Yeah, sure, please. Uh, so, sir, the recent COVID, as we have all seen that the recent COVID pandemic has taken a toll globally and we have seen various virtual platforms coming into being and people are starting to globally the online platforms for learning. As regards to an arbitration, the ODR platforms and the disruptive technologies have also have also gained light. So, we would, our audience would like to know that what is your opinion regarding the efficacy of these platforms? And whether these platforms are temporary in, it, temporary in nature or whether they would stay after the all these things get resolved. Yeah, Amit, thank you so much for a wonderful question, actually. Very relevant and very topical for the times. See, being a coming being a chartered engineer, you know, coming from a technical background, uh, I understand the importance of uh, these technology platforms. And uh, to say that uh, it is the COVID that made people do it. I would not really agree in totality because uh, I don't know if we have chanced upon an article which I had written about uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence in the process of arbitration, which I wrote uh, before this COVID uh, thing had happened. And because uh, if you realize, uh, if in fact, from 2010 itself, uh, with, under the ages of UNDP, the Development Program of the United Nations, uh, uh, India, Mr. Ashwini Kumar was uh, the Minister of Law at that time. They had pumped in like thousands of uh, crores of money in creating of this e codes But unfortunately, uh, today we see that, you know, more than India is number two in the world as far as the number of internet users are concerned. But if you see the number of people who have access to justice is, I mean, uh, nothing comparable. It's few and far. So why is there is a gap? despite people being connected on internet, they still do not have access to justice. The reason is we have not been able to create the platforms which are user-friendly. We have gone in uh, creating uh, platforms, uh, you know, a galaxy of such platforms, but the most important factor with these platforms is uh, there's something called as ICT, uh, which is like information and communication technology uh, adaptation. So if a technology has to be called ICT, it has to be absolutely, uh, you know, user friendly. It has to be trustworthy and it takes care of all other things. So I don't think any of these ODR platforms that have emerged are truly ICT as of now. We are working towards it. The second point I would like to make here, Amit, is uh, I don't, I mean, uh, I encourage the use of word online rather than virtual. Because even when the... Uh, uh, virtual hearing started because courts started to move on uh, online for their hearings. There is uh, a certain uh, people of a certain age group and taste, you know, would not be very convenient of uh, with using ODR. Uh, that's because uh, uh, there are so many complexities involved with it. There are, you know, uh, breakout rooms. You don't know how to go to a breakout room, how to make your own groups to communicate without other people getting to know. How was the documents to be exchanged? How the discovery has to be done? How the annotations have to be done? How the questions have to be framed? The transcription things that goes on with the uh, cross examination and a lot of other things. And also uh, the kind of advocacy that people have had in the court systems, which is something which is really affecting our uh, arbitration also. So with the uh, ODR also another thing is that, uh, yes, the question you asked me is whether it's temporary or whether it's going to uh, continue, it is going to continue. It is inevitable that we move on, not only because it is convenient, but it is cost effective. It is uh, less time consuming, which is in the favor of the parties because all the good things about ODR falls in favor of the parties. So I think there is no reason that people should not uh, move on and be connected with ODR platforms. The only thing is uh, the issues of trust, uh, the issues of, uh, I've been, uh, the classification, I mean, the security classification of the data, uh, the GDPR compliances, I mean, uh, the uh, data subject rights, like, uh, you know, people, they have uh, 
their rights to be forgotten. They have rights to deny that access to their data. Wherever there is personal data being used, the confidentiality of it. Uh, you know, Amit, uh, I don't know if you have, must have been noticing that uh, the two uh, biggest news going around right now in the circles of law is, uh, I know one, you have seen what's happening with the uh, adjudication of various disputes. The second one has been the emergence of ODR. So now what, uh, a word of caution is that uh, uh, what many parties are doing, like mostly the financial and banking institutions for uh, small category loans, for repayment of these loans, they are funding and investing in creating these ODRs. And then there are unilateral appointments, which is happening. Uh, and there are templated awards. There is an uh, AI based uh, templated award, which is being given out with the young uh, lawyers who are just uh, you know, graduating from their colleges and because it's templated it's easy and they just go through a small capsule of like uh, three hours training to be an arbitrator and then they're giving these awards in the favor of the parties who have created them mostly although uh, it will not be correct for me to say that uh, there is a, a kind of a, you know a inclination for these institutions to make awards in favor of a certain party but there's a word of caution that i'm trying to give is that uh, they must keep uh, that particular aspect in mind when they're doing it. So that is uh, very important that they maintain the confidentiality of data, the GDPR regulations, the ease of use, the user interface has to be good. It has to be a true ICT in its technological sense. It has to be free of bias. It has to be balanced. And then it should not be having any kind of inclinations to any of the parties. As far as we are able to meet these requirements, I think ODR is an amazing tool for all age groups. And uh, with the times uh, that we are living in, I think uh, this is something which is going to stay with us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, in addition to the uh, same question that Amit put, uh, considering we are talking about ODR as well as virtual platforms, uh, what kind of use and discussion do you think would be with regard to disruptive technologies, especially in the maritime industry? And how do you think arbitration or maritime arbitration can go forth from there? Yes, again, uh, Anamika, thank you for a good question. So. Uh, Disruptive technology, yes, it's a uh, very intriguing word, you know, disruptive, because people don't like that uses it as a negative connotation. But disruptive in the sense, uh, a technology which is not only uh, uh, makes improvements in the way you work, but it completely disrupts the way you work. I think uh, the technology is like, in fact, let me tell you one thing, uh, both Amit and Anamika, that, uh, you know, there has been, I think, uh, as far as the uh, democracy is concerned, I don't think there is any truly a democracy any, in the world except internet, you know. Internet is the most democratic thing that I know of because it doesn't, uh, you know, have any kind of inclination to people. It is uh, absolutely uh, similar to use by everyone. So that is the importance of uh, use of internet which people must understand. And for a very long time, uh, People have been uh, working to get new technologies to make their lives easy, automations. Then they went into the industry standards 4.0 now for the business standards also. And uh, But it is the invent of blockchain which really uh, changed everything. Because even for the maritime uh, uh, business sector, if I tell you, like uh, there's something called as electronic bills of lading. And uh, even the hague Bisley rules and the Rotterdam rules, uh, uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Use of uh, Electronic uh, Documentation of Communication, which permits uh, usage of uh, electronic uh, ways of communication and electronic bills of lading. But, you know, it's been 20 years or at least 15 years since the invent of electronic bills of lading, but that did not take off because they were relying on a central registry form of uh, exchange of bills of lading. So between a carrier, a shipper and a consignee, the bill of lading would exchange hands and get returned to the shipper in the end. But unfortunately, the reliability was so low and that the key encryptions uh, could be broken and then they could actually be fraud. But with the blockchain, the kind of immutability it brings with it, the kind of uh, you know data reliability and then everybody on that platform is privy to the same truth. There is no way that somebody can fraud in that. 
So it is only with the invent of blockchain based uh, electronic bills of lading that uh, the bills of lading, electronic bills of lading have become acceptable. And also, uh, as far as uh, the uh, disruption of technology is concerned, let me tell you that uh, we are not very far from the times when there will not be any governments. It's a big statement I'm making. Uh, but, you know, like Mahatma Gandhi said, I remember very uh, reading from his uh, biography is that the best governance is the no governance. As of today, I think every aspect of our lives is being governed at a very extremely high levels. But the, with the invent of blockchains and the uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, even the blockchain actually enables the use of autonomous execution of smart contracts, which has made uh, exchanging uh, exchange of uh, financial exchanges, the monetary exchange, very reliable and trustworthy. So imagine of a scenario where people are doing business among themselves without a third party, which is the government intervention or control and including the financial transactions and without losing the much necessary control and the trust between the parties, which is the role of the government actually. So that is how the blockchain disruptive technology is uh, going to, you know, rule our lives. It's going to change everything. And also with the maritime uh, arbitration, it is uh, basically, uh, you know, also very important to understand the way the uh, business work, the maritime business works, the nuances of the business itself. So if this is the kind of uh, technology uh, disruptions that are going to happen in the business, of course, the uh, arbitration and the dispute resolution will also have to keep a pace with that. Thank you for your insights, sir. Uh, we would now like to know, sir, as we have discussed, we discussing about maritime arbitration, and we have heard about your journey uh, to being an arbitrator. What, according to you, is the scope of maritime arbitration in future? And also, what would be your advice to young budding lawyers who want to pursue their career in maritime arbitration? Yes. So, uh, Amit, thank you for your question. So, uh, again, so I have been. Uh, interested in maritime arbitration and uh, also I've been taking uh, training sessions uh, internationally also I've done and uh, here also with the Gujarat Maritime University I recently concluded a training session so to begin with uh, to understand what maritime arbitration is you know mostly people would confuse it with uh, saying it's maritime law training on maritime law or on shipping law but uh, maritime arbitration has three sides of a, a triangle learning actually one is the procedural aspects of arbitration itself, where you would have to learn the ancestral model law to begin with, uh, the New York Convention. You have to understand what are the soft laws of IBA guidelines. And then you have to understand the uh, arbitration of the Conciliation Act of a particular jurisdiction. And then the second side of the triangle would be uh, the various conventions and laws that are applicable. You know, all these conventions, there is something called as uh, Lex Maritima that is called in the maritime world, which is basically a group of all these conventions that have come about. And the power uh, that is drawn to these conventions, why would countries uh, agree and parties, you know, uh, engaging with each other in the maritime contracts would allow a particular convention to apply to their trade? Is that uh, it is it basically the power is drawn from the Article 38 of the uh, the statute of the International Court of Justice, which makes allows all the kind of conventions and treaties and exchange and programs to be uh, valid and enforceable. And the third side uh, and very important of the critical side to the maritime arbitration is the practice of uh, the maritime business itself. And that is why if you see uh, very uniquely in the maritime arbitration, uh, there is a practice the parties prefer uh, only the experts from the maritime industry to be sitting as arbitrators. So whether it is uh, London Maritime Arbitrators Association or whether it is uh, SMA from New York or even the China uh, Maritime Arbitration Center or even the Singapore, which is recently budding, even the EMAC and all, they all have their rules which make it convenient for the parties to choose an arbitrator which has that expertise. I think this is one of the most unique fact, uh, features of maritime arbitration where uh, let's say 95% plus arbitrators are appointed are uh, the uh, maritime experts. A few other unique things about uh, the maritime arbitration is also with the number of arbitrators. 
if you see uh, see uh, maritime arbitration sees uh, even a majority of ad hoc arbitrations but they use institutional rules so lma does not administer arbitrations they only have their rules and the arbitrations are actually ad hoc arbitrations so there is a provision that both the parties can choose their arbitrators without any presiding arbitrator and the two of the uh, arbitrators the panel can adjudicate on the uh, matters of procedure where there are no substantive issues uh, and the documents only arbitration is, uh, is also one of the features which is very common in the maritime arbitration so two arbitrators are also allowed and then they could probably have a presiding arbitrator or an umpire to basically adjudicate and decide on the matters of uh, substantive matters or even the procedural matters of uh, their disputes so that is uh, how i mean uh, even in the uh, practice of maritime arbitration it is uh, you know, important that uh, we have an ecosystem which is uh, uh, where there is a you know exchange of rights and obligations so therefore there are disputes and when there are disputes the practice is good so as an arbitrator you can still uh, sit as an arbitrator internationally but as a counsel as a practicing counsel since we do not have reciproc reciprocity with uh, many jurisdictions where their lawyers can't practice in india so indian lawyers can practice in their jurisdictions for a counsel to practice uh, maritime arbitration in india it's it's important that we uh, build an ecosystem which provides for an environment where there are disputes where even in fact you uh, know that the admiralty act uh, the jurisdiction and the maritime claims uh, issues act has been recently revised in 2017 and the jurisdictions have now been increased to uh, eight high courts eight uh, coastal high courts and therefore there is a uh, big amount of uh, impetus in that country also to create an ecosystem like that so that is why i think it is important that uh, there's a system which allows uh, the practicing councils to deal with the matters of maritime action. so that is how the maritime arbitration will also become yeah uh, so again uh, following up to that question since uh, considering the new changes that have been taking place or you know adaptation to the new normal as we can call it uh, how do you foresee the growth of maritime arbitration as a profession uh, in india considering the uh, technology disruptions which are taking place both globally and nationally and also following up to that as well how do you think maritime arbitrators arbitrators especially in india should you know work or kind of pursue maritime arbitration as a profession in their particular field how they should grow or develop in that particular field Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Anamika. Uh, what I understand you're trying to ask me is that uh, how should uh, the budding uh, lawyers who intend to sit as arbitrators to adjudicate maritime dispute must keep pace with the changes that is happening in the business of maritime trade. So yes, uh, in fact, you know, uh, I uh, find that the law always catches up with the technology. It's not a uh, you know it's not otherwise it's not the technology that is playing a catching up game with the law but whereas the shipping industry is concerned it is a technology that is catching up with the law with the uh, industry because shipping industry though it is very conventional in nature but has always been very uh, you know uh, innovative and uh, uh, acceptable to the new technological changes so that is why it is the technology which is always playing up uh, the catching up game like i mentioned to you the invent of the electronic bills of lading because see even in times of uh, covid when the ships uh, reached their uh, ports of delivery but the bills of lading wouldn't arrive so the late time charges i mean the demurrage charges would just keep piling up so what do you do with kind of uh, certificates of liabilities from the shipper and all those things so those kind of problems would be there so uh, now we must you know, understand that uh, how uh, the new conventions are basically emerging one should always keep pace with that if you see for example uh, even the hamburg rules or the cogsa that is called as that's the uh, convention on uh, the trade by sea uh, the sale of goods by sea act which is the, uh, the principal act but which has taken various forms now you see they got uh, evolved in the forms of uh, hague rules the hague visby rules and then the hamburg rules even the rotterdam rules as of now which basically catered for certain uh, you know shortcomings which are there in the act 
to basically make good of it. So that is the evolution process that they always go through. And then uh, the technology itself, yes. Uh, now, what are we talking about is the complete automation in the shipping industry. The faster processes, faster ships, faster loading and unloading of cargo at ports, and uh, satellite communications. In fact, uh, you could undertake maintenance sitting at the harbor and uh, uh, all ships navigation and everything could be updated in real time to avoid uh, damages. You know the incidents that happened in uh, Mauritius. You know the recent incident of uh, Colombo, where the fire on board a mocking ship, which got, uh, uh, you know, saved in time. So uh, the connectivity issues is one thing which is going to change. We are talking about 5G for ports connectivity and shipping connectivities. There are uh, the complete digitization of the shipping industry is underway. Uh, if you know, there's a, uh, a collaboration of uh, six of uh, six of the biggest uh, shipping firms, uh, which came up to create the platform, the digital platforms for the connectivity. One of them is called as a trade lens. And if you have been following the maritime news, uh, you would have learned that uh, the Kochi Port Limited, the Kochi Port was uh, the first one which went online. I mean, digitized and connected to the trade lens. And the next one was uh, the Adani Port. Uh, they have used this uh, application uh, program interfaces, various APIs that we call them to connect with the trade lens. So what is happening is all the exchange of documentations and the contracts that are happening online, all the, I mean, happening digitally uh, online. So there's a singular platform uh, which has connected the shipping world now. Every kind of standard form contracts, which are very common to the maritime industry, will now get standardized. The terms will get standardized. And something which is very unique to maritime, uh, maritime uh, businesses like uh, most of the contracts, uh, you know, the bill of lading in uh, the maritime world is called as the holy grail because you always vouch for it but you have not been able to arrive there and then you have the charter party agreements and uh, the bill of lading contracts are very uh, common and uh, majority of them are like bill of lading contracts but now the incorporation of the clauses uh, that happens it happens by reference so this is one issue uh, incorporation of clauses by reference from a third party contract or from a main contract or the matrix contract, they call it. So that has been addressed over the years and even till now, there is no clarity on this. Recently, in a case, uh, there's a case law, uh, uh, Volcaf, where they have basically, courts have basically come out on the liabilities of the parties and burden of proof and all those issues. So these are the things uh, which one must keep pace with. And uh, the uh, maritime arbitral institutions like LMAA, is one of the best uh, to keep an eye on. And there, one thing which I have been uh, voicing in various platforms and being a member and arbitrator with them and in the various forums also is that commonality in the understanding of the various laws. Because now the completely complete, as the shipping industry gets united on a digital single platform, it is important to understand these laws with a common understanding. That will only happen if we have all these awards that are coming out of these arbitral institutions get published. So all of us read a similar case law to understand the applicability of a particular clause in the law. Then we will have a common understanding across the world because maritime is very international. Maritime has a very international feature to it, unlike other, uh, uh, you know, businesses. So that is what is very unique to it. And that is how people, I mean, all the, Budding uh, people, I mean, who want to be maritime arbitrators, they must always keep an eye for this, and they should always keep themselves updated with these kind of things. So I think that would be my advice. In short, yeah. Thank you for your valuable insights, sir. Lastly, uh, this question uh, I would ask, like to ask you, sir. There's a famous saying we go by that all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. As now the world is uh, the world is learning to this new online system, so it becomes very necessary to maintain a work-life balance and between the work and finding time for the things you love. For the for the things you love, our audience would like to know, sir, that how do you maintain the same and what are your favorite hobbies and how do you go about these things, sir? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you for that uh, lovely question. I mean, uh, that is very important. I don't know why people uh, take hobby as a, I mean, uh, it's a cliche, but people take it in a negative sense. I don't know. Uh, people are so busy with the work, they think you ask anybody, so what do you do? So he will tell you what work he's doing. And I believe uh, they find that kind of a satisfaction at work. And uh, fortunately, by being in the military, you know, I've been exposed to various facilities for sports and extracurricular activities. And over a period of time, uh, what I have been able to do is, uh, uh, you know, uh, build hobbies that are sustainable for life which is also important. So like, I really like to do underwater diving. Uh, there is one thing that you're underwater, you really have uh, no margins for error. And then the uh, weightlessness that you feel and that kind of, you're free from all kinds of stresses. You're just focusing on what you're doing underwater on your breath. It's a wonderful hobby and I think it is sustainable for life. Uh, also, I love playing golf. Again, a very technical game where, uh, you know, you're playing against yourself. It's a saying that, you know, in the golf world, you don't uh, really have to play against anyone. And it's the uh, epitome of patience and uh, persistence that uh, you have to show. And also, I like uh, riding. I mean, horse riding is one of my uh, favorite hobbies. So I really do it at times, but it is. I know it is not sustainable for life. But yeah, hobby riding is sustainable for life. So... I would love, want to uh, choose to use a word here. I mean, without any doubt that hobby is critical in life. Okay. It's not a, uh, I mean, uh, a matter of choice. Everyone must have a hobby because uh, also from the, uh, you know, other side that if people don't have hobby, that will be overburdening for your colleagues and workers and also for your family. <laughs> I mean, because if you have hobbies, you know, uh, have your time, how to utilize your times and uh, also, and I'm sure you also know from the schools also that like people who are good in academics as well as in sports always did well in life. So it is important. It gives you an overall personality. And also, uh, there is uh, one thing which is important, like when we were beginning, I told you about interpersonal relationships. That is also a one good hobby that people can have to uh, keep uh, building upon the, the new techniques, the new ways to deal with people. I mean, in today's world, it is very important. Although we are meeting online now, but still it is even more important that uh, how you, uh, you know, innovate and the whole kind of that art of uh, communication, the art of negotiation, the art of talking to people, that is also very important to uh, learn. And also if you ask me like uh, uh, two characteristics which, uh, which embolden, like in the Sanskrit, uh, there is a, a, a I mean, saying which say that uh, Jagat Vijayantu uh, Purushartham. We understand what is Purushartham. Like it is, uh, you know, you have to do your work. You have to uh, do what you are supposed to do actually. So that is with that essence, you know, the two qualities or two very uh, important attributes of life, which I could uh, tell you was one was fortitude and uh, other one is empathy. You know, this world is really truly lacking empathy. And it is very important that we empathize with people, to try to understand people I and mean, connect with them on a more personal level. So I think uh, in short, uh, that would be my advice for the young budding lawyers and the people and the things they can do, you know, pick up hobbies, you know, talk to people, build your interpersonal relationships, keep up with the technology, keep up with the changes that is happening in the maritime world, keep up with the laws and conventions, read and write. I love to read and write a lot. So I finish my work, I like come back home like seven, eight o'clock and still I spend a lot of time, like at least two hours every day to write and read. And I think uh, it is very important to read, but also to write because writing meaningfully is an art. Writing is not an art. Okay. <laughs> people can write, but writing meaningfully, which uh, you must understand is important because people generally take it as write, write, write. So they will write whatever comes to their minds. So recently, my article was published verbatim by a platform without asking my permission. So you can understand the kind of things that are happening. The young guys are very quick to, uh, you know, just write something because there's a pressure. They will just pick up some literature from here and there and then just publish it. So you just apply, one has to apply themselves. They have to do some research online and then, you know, come up with something meaningful that somebody who's reading it, uh, it contributes to his knowledge. 
it should not be a you know a gibberish ki yeah something somebody somebody has written and okay just you have to fill the papers you have to fill your magazines you have to fill your you know blogs and everything and they just keep pace with it so write meaningfully and for that you'll have to read a lot i think these in a sense uh, are the things which uh, people should do to keep pace with the changing times yeah thank you sir uh, i think this has been apart from gaining knowledge this has been a really uh, insightful advice to all the budding lawyers out there in all the field whether it be civil criminal maritime arbitration so so that concludes our question round of questions and uh, or as sir called interactive session with center for maritime law national law university odisha we are really thankful uh, to captain singh for taking time out of his busy busy schedule and it was an it was indeed a pleasure to learn from you sir and getting an insights from on all the subjects relating to maritime law we hope that we hope that we uh, we get an opportunity to learn from you in the near future as well lastly before signing off i would just like you to uh, give an advice as to how the center should function and as how the center should progress so yes see i am truly very proud of uh, my you know uh, alma mater which is iit delhi and if you have seen the news lately whether it is covid whether it is uh, international exchange programs i think they are doing a wonderful job and for any university it is very important that how you become uh, truly global and international in the true sense that will happen when you uh, collaborate with the international universities you have exchange programs student exchange programs and then you should continue to work on your uh, programs which you are teaching and to training that you uh, give in part and also like both of you like anamika and amit you have come out you have really arranged this kind of a interview or an interaction with me so you can uh, continue to do these things with all uh, different people you know uh, from the different sectors of business from sectors of law and everybody it gives a lot of good insight into you know what is the new things what people should do and also very importantly what people should not do and as an institution uh, we should always look for uh, what is uh, i call it the foresight uh, cater for the changes that you going to see 10 years from now so one must always have a long term perspective plan a 20 year long term perspective plan where you want to be because unless you know where you want to go you will not know which path to take so if you have your uh, objectives and the uh, goal clear only then you will have a particular path to take and then you should always have a medium term goals and these are the kind of uh, you know leadership uh, styles which uh, all the management in these institutions must exercise and from the top level to the uh, lower most person who is i mean i should not use the word lower most i mean uh, in that uh, vertical field everybody who is equally responsible for that institute must be aligned with that thought with that goal and should work you know uh, comprehensively they should interact build their interpersonal relationships and you must uh, emerge and talk to the world don't remain within yourself don't protect yourself i mean uh, the quality of course has to be maintained but as you start to interact with the world as you open up uh, you will learn and understand that you know what are the good practices and then you will start to adopt them and then your students are truly ambassadors or everything that your institute has been doing so your institute must and must very importantly take it as an essential job to be a cradle of leadership you know you can you have to anyways anybody who has come to uh, the national law university of odisha you know, will become a lawyer there's no doubt but all of those uh, lawyers are going to be different is it possible that all of the lawyers which pass out of nlu odisha becomes the leaders of tomorrow yes that is possible but that will happen if you have the foresight that this is not an institute that is just teaching law this is an institute which is creating leaders for tomorrow but we are teaching them law in the field of law so that is what should be the objective and i think uh, when you do that when you open up when you connect to the world you absorb all the good quality people who really are willing to do things for you you allow them to come and work and associate with you you don't keep your doors closed i mean only when you uh, give out will you be also be receiving so in a sense i think that is important as an institute and i think you are doing a wonderful job and in the last uh, i think i would 
I'm actually uh, running short of words and adjectives to use now because English is, I mean, feelings are very limited by language. But I really want to thank you for reaching out and uh, for having organized this interaction because it uh, benefits me more than what benefits you because uh, sometimes it is important to also express what you feel so that I will be really glad. It will be an honor if some even one person could, you know, uh, uh, learn from what I have said today. So it will be a worthwhile exercise. And I hope uh, I look forward to uh, continued interactions and uh, engagements with you and your institute. And uh, wish you both personally uh, all the very best on all your endeavors and all the people who are uh, in your institute and your families. And do take good care of yourselves. Don't go uh, complacent now. It is a critical times. Take precautions. Encourage everybody to be safe. Take precautions. And uh, yeah, I mean, pick up your hobbies and learn. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Amit and Anamika, for making this wonderful. It was really nice interacting with you and all the best.